My name is Kim Liep. I'm from Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge, they kill all my, my parents. They kill my parents and then the, my brother and my sister. Yeah, and all my auntie. But some of them is uh, starved to death, There's no food to eat. And we got to work uh, from the dark to the dawn. Chăm trên kia cứ nhóm để Về kia vô ba Vô đẹp bọn nhóm ô nâng Kiểu ô nâng lãn Kì chọn lãn chọn đại dưỡng Chọn lãn ô Hay có mùi nhóm kì cụ vật cháu lãn tư lưu kì Thuộc mặt cặp lương á Thuộc thêm đó là cục Mùi nhóm tư mà dụ bí chân nằm I still having a uh, flashback, nightmare, whenever I see, uh, you know, whenever I hear, like we just had the air show last week, the Blue Angel. And so that plane was uh, flying across Cambodia and Vietnam during that time and dropping bomb. And so when we heard that plane, it, it, it reminded us of the war time. Even sometimes I heard the noise like a garbage truck in the morning. Yeah, it sounds like a tank. Sometimes it makes scare me. You know, my family never really brought up the story of the genocide. Eventually, as I got older, I realized it's good to talk about those kind of things. Even though they don't talk about it, they, they, it's still with, it's still inside of them. When you come from a war-torn country and then get placed in the middle of Oakland in the 80s, where there's already rampant drug issues and gang issues and things like that. And now your kids are being picked on and because the kids can't really, you know, voice this to the teachers or anything like that. And they're basically trying to, you know, survive out here as well. They're de now they're picking up like other types of issues and other types of traumas. And I felt like my mom, she, with her going through her own like mental health or whatever you want to call it, she, I guess she rubbed it off on us. So instead of uh, her being loving to us, she she's so quick to like lash out and like throw something at us or pull our hair or because it was done to her that that's the only way she knew how to treat us as well. Um, and I think that she just pretty much took her pain out on us. Imagine that you're walking down the street with a, you're, you're, you're a little kid, you're like three, four, five years old and you're with your grandparents and your parents and they are constantly surveying the scene to see who's going to hurt them and how are they going to get hurt. And they're jumpy and they're looking around and they're maybe yelling at you because you're skipping because they're worried you're going to get killed <laughs> because this is what happens to survivors. They were constantly worried that they would lose their children. They were surviving and they were, you know, and they were either going to be killed or their children were going to be killed or their family member was going to be killed. And so then you hold that in your body Instead of thinking the world is a safe place, you hold it the world is not a safe place because you've been given that message. You've got people yelling at you, telling you not to skip and not to be happy, and they don't mean to be telling you not to be happy, but they're scared for you. And they're scared because they can see you looking around thinking that person's gonna hurt me all the time. And so then they hold this in their body and it just gets reinforced. And then they start walking through the world that way and they start getting those kind of reinforcements back at them and it causes, and they may then start using substances to manage that. They may start getting involved in sexual exploitation because they're looking for love. They may get involved in gangs because they're looking for family and so that just gets kind of we call it multi-generational trauma it just keeps going so I started hanging out cutting school I guess I got into burglarizing homes robberies so school education all of that was I, I completely gave up on that I didn't know how else to take out my anger and I got into some troubles so that meant that I um, was arrested um, so put on probation. I know so many second generation Cambodian folks that don't speak the language, that don't understand the customs, that their parents isolated them from the community because the trust was broken, that they just wanted them to acclimate into American society to speak only English. We identify as Americans. So many of us 
were born and raised here not knowing anything else about our culture. So to think that the Cambodian issues and the Khmer issues are just an isolated thing just for our community to suffer alone is not fair. Uh, we have been a part of the Oakland story. We haven't been, we've been a part of the American story. And I really think that, you know, sometimes me, for me to tell people that I'm Cambodian, many people have so many more questions like, where is that? Or what happened in the war? Or what was the war? There was a genocide? So, so many people are so uneducated about the Cambodian experience. And in, in a way that makes us more invisible. It is very important to uh, understand the genocide and let the next generation know about this because if we don't learn from the past, then uh, we know um, this thing will happen again. So how can we come together to support our youth and to support our elders that have lived here for so many years? Mm -hmm.